Let me uh, also say, as was said earlier, welcome to Palmetto. I'd like to say those of you online, welcome to you as well. Our mission, our folks going on a mission trip to Honduras, I believe uh, leave this Saturday, is that correct? Or Friday night, early morning, something like that. It's coming week. So we're gonna be praying for them. In fact, we'll be praying a special prayer at the end of the service for them. Question, have you ever let fear keep you from going somewhere that you really wanted to go? Have you ever let fear keep you from going somewhere that you really wanted to go? Some say that Louis Armstrong was America's greatest jazz musician. And you may, you may or may not have known this, that he grew up in the swamps of Louisiana in a little shack with his aunt, Hattie Mae. And Louis tells the story of how it was his job every morning to go down to the swamp with his wooden bucket and bring back water. He tells the story of how one morning he went down and as he put the bucket in the water, the head of a big alligator surfaced and scared him to death. They dropped the bucket, ran back to the shack, and his aunt reprimanded him. She said, she said, where's my water boy? And he told her about the gator, this big old gator that had come up. And she said, you go back and get me some water. That gator is just as scared of you as you are him. And he replied, Aunt Hattie Mae, if that gator is as scared of me as I am of him, that water ain't fit to drink. <laughs> so I want to ask you, have you ever allowed fear to keep you from going someplace you really wanted to go? Maybe it was a job interview that you really wanted to take, but you couldn't get up the courage to go to the interview. Maybe it, you, you really did want to apply at that school, but you were afraid you'd be rejected. Maybe you wanted to ask that girl out, but you never got up the courage to do so. Or you really did want to go on that mission trip, but you never signed up. There are a couple of social psychologists by the name of Tom Gilovich and Victoria Medbeck. They've done some research on the psychology of regret. This is one of their specialties. And they found that if you ask people about their immediate regrets, they're pretty evenly split. 53% regret something they did, and 47% regret something they didn't do. But then in their research, they said that when people look back over their entire lives, it's a very different story. About 84% of people regret the things they didn't do, while only 16% regretted the things that they did. So in the long run, it's the things we didn't do because we lacked the courage that weigh more heavily on our minds, the fear that keeps us from the way things might have been. By the way, many churches are the same way. They allow fear to keep them where they are instead of where they ought to be. And, and here's the thing. It will always be safer to be cautious than to be courageous. It'll always be safer to be cautious than to be courageous. I was listening to a biologist, a longevity expert by the name of Gary Brecka, and he said something about aging that really stuck with me. It's on the overhead here. Aging is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. Aging is the progressive pursuit of comfort. In other words, the faster we pursue comfort, the more sedentary our lifestyle, the faster we age. It goes on to point out how every longevity study points to the fact that we have to embrace some kind of daily discomfort to extend ourselves if we want to age well. And when he said that, it, it struck me, that is true spiritually. It's well known in church growth circles that churches have a life cycle and that a church begins to decline, it begins to die when it pursues comfort over growth. In fact, there are a couple of common phrases that you hear in churches that are in decline, that are dying. It's phrases like, we have never done it that way before. Or, we will not change. When a church becomes more concerned with comfort, with not rocking the boat, than stepping out in faith, it begins to die. And by the way, it's true individually as well as collectively. So here's the question I want to ask, a second question. What would you do tomorrow if you were absolutely certain that the Lord was with you? How would you step out in faith? 
How would that embolden you to get out of your comfort zone if you knew that God was on your side? What would that do for the courage of this church if we really believe that? That's what we're going to talk about as today we begin a new series in Joshua. And we're going to be in Joshua chapter 1. It was just read a minute ago, but I want to begin by giving you some context. The story of Joshua is all about the people of God who are finally on the edge of a new era in their history. They're on the move into a new territory after 400 years, you remember, of being slaves in Egypt. That's what the book of Exodus is all about. After 40 years of living in wilderness between Egypt and the land of Canaan, which is what the book of Numbers talks about. And the story of Joshua is all about God's people finally laying claim to a land that's their own which was all a part of God's grand plan to bring Jesus into the world, into a particular part of the world. And so as we read these stories in Joshua and we go through this series, one of the things important to remember is this is a fulfillment of a promise that God made centuries earlier. You go all the way back in Genesis to Genesis chapter 12, where God promised Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation and your descendants are going to bless every generation that follows throughout human history. And along with that promise came the promise they would have their own land. So the book of Joshua is the story of this promise that God made to Abraham centuries earlier, finally being fulfilled as Abraham's descendants claim the land of Canaan. Now eventually, Canaan becomes the land of Palestine, right? And why is that so significant? Well, it's so significant because if you remember, Jesus comes from there. Palestine is the land where the Messiah emerges in the New Testament. Keep in mind that when God was giving this land to the nation of Israel, it, it wasn't just for their sake. It was for the sake of everyone throughout human history. Because when God is relocating his people in this story, he's actually relocating them to the place where the Messiah is going to come out of. In fact, if, if you might know this, it's worth noting the name Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus, Yeshua, right? And really, this story ultimately is all about Jesus. Ultimately, it points to the reality that comes through Jesus. And that fact should make the book of Joshua really important to us because we need to be reminded that as much as this land is going to be a blessing to Israel, it's not just about blessing Israel. It's about putting Israel in a position to bless others down throughout history. Part of the reason is blessings are never just about you. God's blessings are never just about you. God wants to bless you. He wants to work in your life. But your blessings are never meant to end with you. God's blessings in your life are meant to travel through you in order to bless others, to make a difference in others around you. That, because that's the way God's blessings travel. God works through you. He blesses you to bless others. And so these stories in Joshua are going to speak to us individually and collectively. And we're going to break down the message this morning in this way. We're going to look at, number one, the certainty of God's promise. Number two, the confidence in God's presence. And number three, the centrality of God's word. So we begin with the certainty of God's promise. You know, Mark read just a few minutes ago, one of the first things you read in Joshua chapter one, we find out that Moses is He's dead. And of course, Moses was an extremely important leader for the people of God. He leads them out of slavery. He writes the first five books of the Bible. Uh, the people of Israel, when he dies, they mourn him for 30 days. And yet, uh, he's such a great leader. And yet, God, here in chapter 1, gives him an extremely short eulogy. It's like Moses is dead. Now it's your turn, Joshua. By the way, I think one of the lessons of that is that you're not as important as you might think you are. He says, okay, Joshua, it's your turn. Now, I want you to put yourself in Joshua's shoes. Moses is a tough act to follow. Do you think he had any feelings of inadequacy? Do you think Joshua felt maybe some insecurity because he's human? And he's thinking, who am I to lead all these people into the land that God our Father promised them? Maybe you can relate. Have you ever been given a responsibility for which you feel inadequate? Maybe it's a promotion. Maybe you get the lead on a project. Or maybe you find out you're going to be a mom or you're going to be a dad. And you think, man, I don't feel qualified for this. 
Joshua is taking over the leadership of Israel, a nation that's not exactly known as being a people who's easy to lead. In fact, they're very, very difficult. At one point, God calls them stiff-necked and rebellious because they have a history of grumbling and complaining, a history of disobeying God and not following Moses and not doing what they're supposed to do. In fact, on one occasion, they even begin to plot to stone Moses and Aaron. This is the people you think twice about leading, and God taps Joshua on the shoulder and says, you're it? Your turn. Why? Because God says, I made a promise, and I intend on keeping it. If you look at verse 3 again, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. See, Moses is dead, but God's promises don't end because of funerals. By the way, same thing today. God's promises don't end because of funerals. God says, I made a promise and so I'm going to keep it. And Joshua, you're it. Which leads us to the next point. The confidence in God's presence. Confidence in the presence of God. Look at verse 5 and 6 again. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Now, imagine again being Joshua, and you hear God say these words to you. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. And then God says something that he's going to repeat two times back to back. Be strong and courageous. He says it again in verse 7. Look at verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Then he says it again in verse 9. He says, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So within four verses, God says to Joshua three times, I want you to be strong and courageous. Why do you think God said that three times? It's because Joshua needed to hear that three times. Because he's feeling anything but strong and courageous. He's feeling weak need and scared. It is a huge responsibility leading millions of people who have been on a 40-year camping trip. And he's being charged with leading them to take possession of a land which, by the way, is currently occupied by the Canaanites. And the Canaanites have a military and they have weapons and they have training and the Israelites have none of that. Now, you remember... By the way, when the Israelites first approached the promised land, all the way back in Numbers chapter 13, and God tells Moses, I want you to send out some men to explore the land. And they send out 12 spies to look over the land of Canaan. And Joshua was one of the 12 spies sent into Canaan to explore the land and report back. And you may also remember the story that 10 out of the 12 spies come back and say, forget it. Forget it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the land's flowing with milk and honey, but it also grows giants. We look like grasshoppers next to them. Forget it. And only Caleb speaks up and says, we should go take the land. We can do it. God is with us. He's promised us that. Caleb is the one who speaks. Joshua is quiet. But he is also put on the courageous side with Caleb. In other words, they're men of faith and courage, trusting in God to give them the land. But now, fast forward, Joshua chapter 1. He's the one in charge. And God tells him three times, I need you to be courageous, strong and courageous. He's not so courageous. Has anything like that ever happened to you? He's the one in charge, and suddenly things change. Have you ever thought, man, if I I was in charge, I'd tell you what I'd do. I'd tell you exactly what I would do if I were the one in charge, and then suddenly you find yourself in charge, and it looks a whole lot different than it did. It's like the people who are experts at parenting before they have kids right? Man, when I have kids, if I ever had, my kids would never, and those of you with kids are like, I can't wait. Uh, We'll see if you're still an expert, right? When that three-year-old has gotten on your last nerve, we will see what an expert in parenting you are. Because you know what's going to happen. You know they're going to wrestle with all kinds of insecurity, all kinds of fear as a parent. In the end, they'll just be hoping they don't mess them up too badly. Joshua is now in charge, and he's wrestling with all kinds of insecurity and fear. But God says, as I was with Moses, 
so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Now, if you think back to Moses, when God speaks to him through the burning bush, he says, I want you to confront Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And Moses is completely freaked out. I mean, number one, God is speaking to him through a bush, right? And number two, he's told to go face the most powerful ruler of the then known world and give an ultimatum to him. Ultimatum, you let my people go or else. And that's why God says to him uh, in Exodus 3, I, I will be with you. The point is that every time in scripture God calls someone to do something, he always promises his presence. Every single time. Why? Because God always calls them to do something that would be, be beyond their capacity to do it without his help. If you feel called to do something you can do on your own without the help of God, then your calling isn't big enough. In fact, it may not be from God. And that's true for individuals. It's especially true for churches. God is not interested in calling you to do anything that you could do apart from him. He's not interested in you learning how to do life without him. He calls us to do things that are bigger than us for the purpose of causing us to depend on him. Always. So if you find yourself at a point in your marriage, if you find yourself at a point in your parenting, in your work, in your ministry, in leadership, if you find yourself at a point where you think, I can't do this by myself anymore, you're exactly where God wants you to be. Exactly. I think of Paul's words, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning of verse 9. Paul writes, but he said to me, this is God speaking to him, my grace is sufficient for you, my for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul writes, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults and hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, listen, it is okay to express our weakness and our inability because then it forces us into dependence on God. To say, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know if I have the strength or the ability. And Paul says, good, good, good. Delight in that. Boast in that because now you're ready for God's power to rest on you. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. God's promises always come with his presence. And so we've talked about the certainty of God's promise. We've talked about the confidence in his presence. Now we go to the next one, the centrality of God's word. The centrality of his word. Joshua is now, he's the military leader. He is the commander in chief. Some would say of about two and a half million people who are going to go in the promised land. And what's one of the first things that God tells him to do right after telling him to be strong and courageous? Look back at verse seven and eight again. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. That you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. By the way, it's interesting to me. This is the only place in the Bible where those two words, prosperous and successful, are in one verse. And it has to do with Joshua's relationship with God's word as a leader. What command does God give Joshua that is so necessary for Joshua to obey if he's going to lead two and a half million people into the land? Well, basically, he's saying to Joshua, hey, Joshua, read your Bible and follow the instructions. And Joshua had a Bible of sorts, right? It was the book of law that God had given Moses. And as a leader, it was Joshua's job to do more than just read it. He was to meditate on it. What's that? Meditate. Well, let, me, let me put it to you this way at first. Let me answer it this way. You're always meditating on something. Always. <laughs> Maybe you're meditating on the news. Some of us meditate on music. Maybe you're meditating on a hobby. Others of us meditate on our fears. Sometimes we meditate on sins that we think about committing. Sometimes we meditate on the sins of others against us. Some of us meditate on what ifs. The point is, 
that we've always got this program running where we are meditating on something. And so you might ask, well, what does it mean to meditate? It comes from a Hebrew term, which means, which implies muttering or speaking softly often to oneself. How many of you ever speak to yourself? And answer yourself, right? Some of you got a conversation. And really, that's the idea behind this word meditate. It's, it's also similar to the idea of an animal chewing its cud, where an animal chews and swallows and then regurgitates and then chews some more. That's what it means to meditate. It's similar to that idea of meditation. We do that with our thoughts. We constantly chew on our thoughts. We swallow them and we bring them back up and we chew on them some more. And we do this with dreams, we do it with fantasies, we do it with desires, we even do it with sin sometimes. We do this with imaginary angry speeches to our enemies. We all have this internal process of meditation running all the time. Paul says in Romans 10, 17, consequently faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Now, here's what's interesting. Sometimes the, uh, sometimes the person speaking and the person hearing can be the same person. When we meditate on God's word, we are both speaking to ourselves and hearing it, building up our faith in the process. Think about those moments when you're meditating on the word of the Lord, whether it's in your car or at home, early in the morning, whatever it might be, you're speaking it out, talking to yourself, reinforcing the message in your mind and in your heart. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. So God is telling Joshua, I want you to meditate on my word. Why? Why is that so important? Because what you focus on becomes larger in your life. What you focus on gains power to influence your mind and your heart. What you focus on grows in your life, for better or for worse, it grows in your life. There was a famous uh, incident that's told about something that happened in South Bend, Indiana at the University of Notre Dame more than 80 or 90 years ago. And the story is told how that Notre Dame was about to play the USC Trojans in football. And, and USC was number one and undefeated at the time. They were coming to South Bend to play. And Newt Rockney, the famous coach of Notre Dame, was aware that USC had far better athletes during that time. And so as the story goes, Rockney scoured the area of South Bend, Indiana, looking for, guy, for 75 to 100 of the largest men that he could find. All of them were over about six foot four, pushing 250 pounds, which back then was really, really big. And he took all these men, and this was, by the way, long before the day where they would limit how many players you could have on a roster. He took all these men, he had extra uniforms made, and he had them suited out before the USC Notre Dame game. And he knew he couldn't field them, but he paraded 75 to 100 extra Notre Dame fighting Irishmen, these huge, burly guys out on the field. And they warmed up in front of the Trojans of USC. And then Rockney left them on the sidelines for the entire game. And the Trojans of USC, the reporters would say, the Trojans of USC could not keep from looking at these big men on the Notre Dame sideline. And Rockney would later say, I knew I had them beat before we even took the field. And sure enough, that day, USC was so busy meditating on the size of the players on the sidelines, they forgot their assignments, and the Irish beat the tar out of them that day. That's what happened to the Israelites in the wilderness 40 years earlier when God first tried to give the land to his people. 10 of the spies came back and said, we can't do it, they're just too big. And that bad report, scripture says, spread throughout the entire camp and all the Israelites began to meditate upon it, to chew on it, except for two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb. The two hold out spies. They focused on the promise of God, what God has said. God is giving us the land. They chose to meditate on the promise of the Lord rather than the size of the giants. One of the biggest obstacles I think that you and I often have to taking what God has in store for us is what's between our ears and our heart. <laughs> That's why scripture talks so much about being renewed 
by transforming yourself by being renewed in the mind. And that's why meditating on the Word of God is so important because I need my mind renewed daily, daily. And so I want to end this message by taking you back to a question I asked toward the beginning. What would you do tomorrow if you were absolutely certain that the Lord was with you? How would that embolden you? How would you step out in faith if you were absolutely sure that the Lord is with you? What river would you cross if you knew the Lord was on your side? So many individuals and churches live their existence on the wrong side of the river because they're playing it safe. They're being cautious and they're stuck. And the truth is, if you want to stay on that side of the river and live a comfortable life, a scared life, you'll always be able to put together a fact sheet as to why you should attempt nothing, try nothing, risk nothing. You can always put together facts as to why you shouldn't do it. But courageous churches and courageous people don't live by excuses. They live by promises. And Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 20 that he would be with us always. This morning, are you following Jesus? Are you his disciple? Will you put your trust in him? Will you put your allegiance in him? Which is really what the word faith means. If you haven't been baptized into Christ, the water's ready. If you're a Christian and you need to pray with one of our shepherds this morning, they'd be honored to pray with you. Let's stand. Let's sing.